the year 1839, at a place called Neisner, on the southern tip of the African continent, a man died and was buried whom many people believed, and many people still believe, to be the eldest legitimate son of King George III of the so-called United Kingdom of Great Britain. The man's name was George Rex, and this is his grave. This burial place is uh, reality. But first, I will tell you about the legend. On October the 12th, 1730, was born a female child named Hannah Lightfoot. Her parents belonged to the Christian Quaker faith, and they lived here in Wapping, London, England. When Hannah was three years old, her father died, and she and her mother Mary moved to live in this posher vicinity of London, close to the old opera house in St. James. In the year 1753, the Prince of Wales, the future King George III, was 15 years old, and while he was patronizing the Opera House, His Royal Highness saw Hannah, who was discreetly watching his royal progress. The Prince was smitten by Hannah's pure beauty and he persuaded a Miss Elizabeth Chudley, a lady in waiting to his royal mother, to arrange an introduction. At that time, Hannah, known as the Fair Quaker, was 23 years old. Um, the, the legend says that Miss Chudley arranged a meeting place for the potential lovers. But Hannah Lightfoot had been brought up as a Puritan Quaker and, um, well, unlike our British royal family, she could not acquiesce to a casual arrangement, not even with the heir to the throne. Only marriage was acceptable. And when the Prince of Wales, his royal mother, and indeed King George II himself, learned what was in the air, the scheming Miss Chudley is said to have contrived a most vivid and deceptive plot. She arranged for Hannah to be apparently married to a young man named Isaac Axford at a chapel here in Mayfair. London. Hannah suffered the ceremony, but refused to answer any of the clerical questions or to wear the wedding ring. Then the uh, false bride was hastened to the church door, where she was immediately abducted into a waiting carriage, which charged away, scattering all opposition with a cry of, Royalty! Hannah Lightfoot disappeared from public view as if a magician had worked a magic spell. Or a royal authority had shown a firm hand. And Hannah's beloved mother Mary never ever saw her good daughter again. The Quaker movement was finely organized and everything that pertained to their faith was done with puritanical thoroughness. Hannah Lightfoot was a Quaker and for well over one year the Quakers searched London for her. This is their final report. Whereas Hannah Lightfoot did then enter into a state of marriage by a 
priest. Not of our society which is repugnant amongst us. We endeavor to find where she was, but to no purpose, nor could we obtain any intelligence as to where she is. We therefore disown Hannah Lightfoot until she signifies her unfeigned sorrow for her offense. Early this century, a Miss uh, Mary Pendered published a searching and sensitive book which was inspired when she read letters which gave no address written by Hannah Lightfoot to her mother. Hannah Lightfoot assured her mother that all was well and that a certain person would protect them both. No name is given to the person and the letters could not be published. This sort of conspiratorial secrecy pervades our whole story from Hannah Lightfoot right through to the end of George Rex, far, far away in Africa. And Miss Pendered wrote in her book, Hannah Lightfoot faintly called to me out of those faded letters and bade me write as best I could, her short and moving story. She is the only woman for whom the right to reign over the British people has been claimed. Yet she must have been the least arrogant and most retiring of women. On a later occasion, uh, Miss Pendered approached uh, Hannah Lightfoot's uh, descendant again and asked about the letters. The uh, very old lady replied that they had been destroyed. And she implied that there had been some pressure brought to bear on her to do so. Uh, the old lady remarked about the destruction was better so. Perhaps the last positive, historically proven references to poor Hannah Lightfoot were contained in a will which came from Hannah's tragic mother. It is dated 1760 and reads, I leave my property to my daughter Hannah I am not certain whether she is living or dead, not having heard from her since about two years past. And in uh, royal court circles, only uh, odd rumors flitted around. And in the year 1759, Lady Sophia Egerton addressed her uncle the Count Bentick. Oh. It has often been buzzed that the Prince of Wales, in spite of his reserve, is not wholly insensible to the passion of love. And I am assured that at least one child is the province of this um, intrigue. The legend of Hannah Lightfoot and the Prince of Wales informs us that they were married twice. First, at this uh, Kew Chapel on April the 17th, 1759, and then at their secret home in London. But uh, these uh, records of marriage have disappeared, uh, like much else, elsewhere. However, the present vicar of Kew has some information on this uh, disappearance matter. This chest used to contain the parish registers, including all the records of marriages having taken place in this church 
since 1714. On the night of February the 22nd, 1845, someone broke into the church and stole the chest with all the registers. It was found three weeks later, empty and upside down, having been thrown over Kew Bridge into the Thames. The contents of the chest have never been found. Do you sense that they were married in this chapel? I, I think the feeling generally is that they must have been. There was so much um, uh, chicanery went on around this theft, with a poster being issued to offer a reward uh, for the apprehension of the thieves. Uh, and the whole thing really is a bit sort of uh, sinister, uh, given the fact that the chest was returned and the registers never, never discovered. It's likely, I think, that uh, it was organized. Over 100 years later, in the year 1866, a Mrs. Lavinia Rives had a reason to produce a series of documents here in the Court of Chancery, London. And amongst these documents were what was claimed to be the two marriage certificates of Hannah and the Prince. One document reads, May the 27th, 1759. <laughs> this is to certify that the marriage of these parties, George, Prince of Wales, and Hannah Lightfoot, was duly solemnized this day according to the rites and ceremonies of the Church of England. J. Wilmot. And this certificate is endorsed George Guelph. That is uh, our British royal family's real surname and Hannah Lightfoot. And witness to the marriage of these parties, William Pitt, that is the sometime great Prime Minister of England, Lord Chatham. In court, the Attorney General of England simply stated, I do not disguise from myself that this is nothing less than a claim to the British throne. The Lord Chief Baron was appalled. It really is a great indecency to inquire into matters like these, affecting our royal family. And then this legal might of England brought into the arena Mr. Nethercliffe, the most renowned, acknowledged handwriting expert in this British land. The establishment was very confident. Mr. Nethercliffe uh, studied the signatures with the greatest care and then made himself singularly unpopular with the crown representatives by bravely pronouncing signatures not forgeries they're undoubtedly genuine the lord chief justice then pounded honest mr nethercliffe with a prolonged interrogation but the state's very own handwriting expert would not be browbeaten the signatures of genuine. The Attorney General of England immediately ordered this documentary evidence to be impounded and placed in a strong room at Somerset House. But, after so many years of British government suppression, the present authorities have decently released them to us for our perusal. And amongst these sometime impounded documents is one which states, this is to solemnly certify that I married George, Prince of Wales, to Princess Hannah, his first consort, April the 17th, 1759, and that the true princes and a princess were the issue of that marriage. J. Wilmot. 
Oh, uh, J. Wilmot, incidentally, was James Wilmot, an eminent divine and a fellow of Trinity College, Oxford. He was also described by the distinguished author William Beckford as good scholar, sincere Whig, an intimate friend of Lord Chatham, and enjoying the exclusive confidence of His Majesty, King George III. And the eldest of these two princes was, so our legend continues, George Rex, who is buried over in Neisner at the furthest extremity of southern Africa. And finally, amongst these documents which the British Court of Chancery impounded, was what was purported to be Hannah Lightfoot's last will and testament. It reads, I commend my two sons and my daughter to the kind protection of their royal father, my husband, His Majesty George III, bequeathing whatever property I die possessed of to such dear offspring of my ill-fated marriage. Amen. Hannah Regina, that is Queen Hannah, witnesses J. Dunning, William Pitt, again Lord Chatham. Overwhelming mystery, if not secrecy, now encompasses Hannah Lightfoot, except for one inexplicable shaft of delightful light. At no park in England there hangs a portrait painted by the great Sir Joshua Reynolds. In the year 1817, while King George III was still on the throne, this portrait was described in the Venetian gallery portrait of the fair Quaker who was uh, noticed by His Majesty when Prince of Wales. George Rex, the legendary eldest son of the King of England, etc., etc., sailed into Cape Town, South Africa during October 1797. Two years previously, Britain had decided to take over this strategically important Cape of Good Hope from the Dutch because of dangers engendered by the French Revolutionary Wars. George Rex was given a royal warrant. And George III, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France and Ireland, King Defender of the Faith, have granted unto George Rex the office of Marshal and Sergeant Mace of our Vice Admiralty of the Cape of Good Hope. And this is George Rex's Mace of Office, treasured by a direct descendant here in Africa. Meanwhile, in Cape Town, in the year 1801, a Mr. Twistle, was reported to have objected to George Rex's appointment. Mr. Rex, almost on his arrival, has been presented with one of the best posts in the colony. Of course, Mr. Rex is uh, not only the son, but is also the legitimate heir of our king. For his mother, the Quaker, and King George, were joined in marriage before ever Queen Charlotte was thought of. What are the possible reasons, if George Rex was the son of the British monarch, for his 6,000 mile journey into exile? 
Well, the British throne was very wonky. At that time, I hasten to add, the Gill family, the royal family of Britain, were despicable to a large part of the British nation. The royal family often practiced a stupendous immorality, were arrogant and astonishingly thick-headed. They had supervised the successful revolt of the American colonies against Britain. They had stubbornly observed the reasons for the French Revolution and had not noticeably reacted. And these German Guelphs had approved of massive English injury to Ireland, the result of which bites into wretched Britain to this day. And therefore, the British Revolution was on the cards. Any new royal scandal was best put out of the way. Perhaps uh, some 6,000 miles out of the way. The descendants of George Rex here in Africa tells us that their ancestor, George Rex, was summoned to his royal father's presence. We have arranged for you to go to the Cape of Good Hope. You must never return to England. You must never marry. There must be no legitimate heirs. And you must never speak of our relationship. His Majesty gave his sons gifts to remember him by. Arrangements will be made that for as long as he lived, he would be well provided for. That is the family belief of the descendants of George Rex. The vast, evolving pieces of British Empire were pawns in the high-handed, bloody struggles of Europe. In the year 1803, this territory, called the Cape of Good Hope, was handed back to the Dutch by the powers that once were in London. And that imperial gesture put George Rex and the other British officials in Southern Africa into a difficult situation. The new Dutch government was, understandably, not fond of it. George Rex, together with other Britishers, were rounded up and interned here at Stellenbosch, South Africa. There was a rush for passengers back to the uh, old country. Only 70 stubborn Britishers remained in the camp. And among them was George Rex. And like everyone else who refused to leave South Africa, it was demanded that he swore an oath of allegiance to the Dutch government. And this George Rex adamantly refused to do. But for some strange reason, he survived Dutch anger and he achieved exactly what he wanted. He applied to the Dutch authorities to be allowed and as a loyal British citizen to travel to a remote area called Neisner on the distant eastern frontier of the Cape. Indeed, the place was a no man's land with the rare European shelters often blackened from raids by the warrior tribe of Corsas. George Rex was preparing to turn his back forever on his homeland England. He was preparing to exist in a foreign land the forlorn tag of the universe. The glowering Dutch somehow agreed to his quixotic hopes. The British subject, George Rex, has received due permission for residence in this colony. 
And so George Rex set off eastward towards Neisner. And with him was his beloved woman friend, whom he had met in Cape Town, and their two infant sons, Edward and John. She had been a colored slave. And George Rex purchased her emancipation together with the emancipation of her four children by a previous union. It was a solid partnership, but George Rex would not marry her. The Rex legend explains that he would not break his promise to his royal father. The Rex family did not travel alone. There was a carriage drawn by eight white horses. George Rex took with him artisans of every possible trade, blacksmiths, bricklayers, house servants, and even an apothecary. In addition, there were over a hundred slaves, and 16 vast ox wagons pulled the impressive uh, necessaries. One is forced to wonder where all that money came from. No one knows how long the pioneering journey took, but finally they arrived at the virtual frontier outpost, an abandoned cottage named Melkert Claw. It had been a ruin. Very recently, African tribesmen had killed and burnt everything in the area, but now the uh, Mysterious George Rex had arrived and proceeded to build a rustic empire. Melkert Kral soon became an isolated oasis of European standards. And soon George Rex owned about 22,000 acres of magnificent pasture and indigenous African forest. A plan was drawn of the new Melkert Kral, and inscribed across it is the British Sovereign. Who wrote that legend? No one knows. All around Melkert Kral, he planted the flowers of Britain. Daisies, forget-me-nots, honeysuckle, briar roses, and violets. He wanted the most British of trees, the oak, to predominate. This is George Rex's avenue of oaks that led to Melka Crawl, and they are all that survive of his famous home today. Was all of this to be expected on the cruel frontier, or was there something very special located here? The list of dignitaries who made these pioneering journeys and stayed with the Rexes is disturbingly impressive. And in addition came uh, scientists, particularly botanists. A connection grew up between Neisner and the great Royal Kew Gardens of London. And then George Rex became obsessed with a grand new idea. Neisner's located on the edge of a magnificent lagoon. From the land side meanders a river, and the only exit for the lagoon's water is through a narrow channel into the southern ocean. George Rex visualized what was virtually his lagoon as a fine natural harbor. But he also saw that a deadly barrier of rocks just below the surface of the sea almost closed the door on his vision. In those days of sail, to enter Neisner Lagoon from the great southern ocean demanded tenacity and courage. Uh, George Rex was not daunted, and he began to nag the now-returned British Royal Navy at Cape Town. No one can deny that George Rex had huge influence. And in the year 1817, the Royal Navy brig, the Emu, 
set sail from Simonstown, the British naval base, to make the attempt. Bravely the ship went in, but met a headwind and she was wrecked. However, George Rex's influential determination predominated, and some few weeks later, the sloop of war HMS Patagas came up from Cape Town and crossed safely between this barrier of rocks. George Rex was apparently vindicated. George Rex built his own ship up here on the estuary of the Neisner River. The old slipway was discovered in 1946 and the local town council had the imagination to save its old timbers and to transform them into a civic table and a set of civic chairs and they made a model of George Rex's ship the Neisner. George Rex gave careful thought to developing his Neisner towards spiritual and educational progress. A son-in-law, Captain Thomas Duthie, later the 72nd Highlanders, settled on Rex land, just across the lagoon from Neisner, and he built um, his church. Around here it is sometimes difficult to believe that one is not in the kingdom of Great Britain. And throughout all of this positive creative work around the lagoon of Neisner, George Rex refused to discuss even the rumor that he carried British royal blood. Some of his descendants will murmur the old family history. Long, long ago, one of his small daughters ran up to him and broke the rule which the older Rexes knew not to transgress. The child blurted out, Papa, everybody says that you are the son of King George III. The exile replied, Do they? Or do they? And that was all. One day, so the family legend goes, George Rex visited the great Neisner forest and he accidentally left the keys of his private study behind. His lady, Carolina, could not resist the temptation to solve the aura of sad mystery. She entered the room and she read his very private papers. When George Rex returned, Carolina openly confessed what she had done, and he quietly replied, These papers belong to my life in England. Until now, no one has ever seen them here in Africa, and no one else ever shall. My secret must die with me. And George Rex there and then burnt those papers in the fireplace of his house. He then made Carolina swear an oath that she would never divulge what she had already read. 
The children and grandchildren often begged her, but she always steadfastly refused to quote one word. And that uh, tradition of a royal silence sometimes pertains to this day. When visiting artists wanted to draw a portrait of George Rex, he adamantly refused. One artist, uh, so the Rex family has said, travels specially from Britain to paint the whole family. Who instructed that journey has not even been hinted at. But the patriarch would not allow it. The common belief was that he refused these recordings because he and his children resembled the British royal family too closely. George Rex's sister, Sarah, lived at 17 Henrietta Street, Bath, England. She also never married, and she also was well off. George and Sarah wrote to each other, and a few of the letters have survived, but only from the later years. The letters from the preceding 32 years have all disappeared. In general, the uh, surviving correspondence is uh, intelligently straightforward. But there are some inexplicable aspects. One letter from George Rex reads, I have had accounts of the death of George IV for some time, but the governor over at Cape Town has not yet received his official dispatch. How did George Rex receive such news for some time before the governor received his official dispatch from England and George Rex being so isolated? And the letter continues, A few days ago I got news of the revolution in France and consequent flight of their king. Well, it would seem that George Rex in isolated Neisner was kept better informed about royal events in Europe than I am here in Africa today. In a letter to George Rex, written in the year 1838, oh, incidentally, the coronation year of Queen Victoria, his sister Sarah ends and accept my dear brother, the love of. And whatever words followed have been carefully cut away. And there are other carefully cut excisions. Why? At 6 a.m. on the morning of April the 3rd, 1839, George Rex suffered a formidable stroke his son-in-law, Captain Duffy, stated he was conscious to the last. But it was also reported that his iron silence gave way and the old man began to mumble memories of long ago. It has been said that he began to repeat my royal father. family have told us that their founder made two categorical requests. The royal insignia that appears on our cutlery and elsewhere must be obliterated. But not everything was spotted. I must be buried 
at night now, on my estate, under no circumstances must my bones be removed and buried in England. And as the patriarch was dying, his devoted friend and mother of nine of his children said, I would like to be married to you. To my royal father. Within two hours, he was dead. During the last few years of his life, it was George Rex's second eldest son, John, who managed the vast estate. And it was he who attended to the uh, funeral arrangements. It was ultra-responsible John who wrote out his father's death notice. Name of deceased, George. Rex. Birthplace of the deceased, London. Names of the parents of the deceased. Ah, this is the question. And honest John Rex, carefully inscribed. Not. No. Parents of George Rex. Not known. And finally, George Rex's will was opened. Uh, having shared his impressive estate amongst his dependents, he had then taken decisive legal care to emphasize that all of his beloved children were illegitimate. And bear in mind that he was the sort of man who had anxiously provided land for the Christian churches around Neisner. This part of his will reads, I, George Rex, residing at the Neisner, and not having submitted myself to the matrimonial laws of this colony. Does the legend of George Rex's last words, under no circumstances must my bones be buried in England, and then this brutal factual advertisement of the illegitimacy of his heirs hark back to the legend of King George III's last words, parting words, to his eldest son. I must never marry. There must be no legitimate heirs. However, in spite of declining fortune, no other settlement on the whole continent of Africa can claim so many visits from members of the British royal family as Neisner. Pure coincidence or British royal curiosity? In the year 1867, Queen Victoria's son, His Royal Highness Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh, came to Neisner to ostensibly see the scenery and uh, to shoot elephants. Incidentally, at least three members of the Rex family were with His Royal Highness when he uh, went shooting the, uh, oh, the poor bloody elephants. And Princess Alice visited this uh, isolated spot that peeps across the great ocean to the South Pole. And Princess Victoria and the Duke of Windsor, uh, later to become, briefly, King Edward VIII when he was Prince of Wales. 
And speaking as a Welshman, I can only recall that uh, uh, royal chap visiting Wales, which was on his doorstep twice. And our present queen, when a princess, traveled towards this distant, mysterious night. Over ten years ago, in 1983, I was filming here in this Cape Town castle, and the subject of George Rex had not entered my otherwise preoccupied head. Out to the corner of my uh, left eye, I saw two black ebony chairs. But what made me stop my hurried progress, because I am a Welshman, were the two Prince of Wales feathers on the backrests of each. I then visited Miss Joy Collier, the distinguished South African artist and historian who long ago had visited Miss Duffy, a Rex descendant, at her family home beside Nysna Lagoon. Miss Collier, would you please tell me about your memories of Miss Duffy? in Neisner. Indeed, I remember very well meeting her down at Neisner. She was poor, but she had the presence of a princess, as indeed she believed she was. And then she took us up to her house and showed us these chairs with the Prince of Wales feathers on the back, which immensely impressed us. Probably no, his house was burnt soon after his death, and everything in it. Not obviously everything, a few things were saved, the chairs, for instance. But uh, most of the stuff was gone, and one does wonder whether that fire was deliberate or not. Why might it be deliberate? Well, evidence has been suppressed in England. It was probably the idea of suppressing any evidence that was hanging around that beautiful old house. No one can prove categorically that George Rex was not the rightful heir to the British throne. Nor can I prove that he was. All I have done is to present the evidence which suggests that he was. And I will now call upon George Rex's direct male descendant to say what he thinks and feels about this but royal matter. We have our belief and we have our tradition and we've nurtured that faith for well over 150 years. And it remains important to us. None of the family have ever really got together and said, right, what do you know about this? Let's put our heads together. It's all been very much kept in the closet. I can just recall from my early days being, almost being, it being whispered to you know that you have blue blood. Almost as though it was something that to be ashamed of. Or, but in fact it was something to, to be hidden. Uh, and then there was the, uh, the other angle which rather tempered the the, the blue blood angle, and that was that Anna van der Karp, we don't know what nationality she was, but she was certainly a black lady. This was very common in those early days, but at the time when I grew up, this was, I was living in a very much racial South Africa. A party. Huh? What if it was proven? Uh, that suddenly you were the legitimate heir to the British throne. What do you think might happen to you? What would you and your wife decide to do about it? I don't believe that we would uh, want to change our lifestyle. Our sights are not that high, quite honestly. And I don't believe that we could adjust to such traumatic uh, change. It is royal food for thought, isn't it? 